Oh. Oh. That's how most of you respond. As the Bible says, as in the day of Noah, men will be eating and drinking and giving in marriage. That's going to be what the condition of the world is to include the professing church when Christ returns. This is what I know, unless there's a dramatic change, African Americans, evangelicals will, and whole cloth, vote for Democratic Party or candidates who will affirm abortion on demand. 2,880 children. Over 1,000 of them being African-American will be slaughtered today in the very place that it should be the safest, the womb of this mother. African-Americans will vote for Democratic candidates who will reject God's decree that a man should leave his mother and his father, cleave to a woman, and what God has joined together, let no man put us under. African-Americans will vote for political candidates that pass Illinois Senate Bill 818, which will require school districts who teach sex education to teach as early as kindergartens. Uh, things like what it is to be a child desiring to have a sex change take hormone blockers. And that's quite simply, it stops a girl from puberty and, and getting what goes along with coming to, into womanhood. It stops a male uh, from the natural biological process of becoming a man. And, and so all on the altar of self-expression. No matter that the Bible says uh, in, in the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. Illinois legislative, the Illinois uh, General Assembly says that there is a gender continuum. And if you're smart enough, you know what they're saying. There's a broad perspective on both ends. And I don't know. I'm just from a, I'm just a simple country boy from Mississippi. And I just grew up for the first 50 some years of my life understanding they were male and they were female. And I understand uh, there have always been people who have struggled with gender dysphoria. Nothing new. In fact, the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. But um, you guys are just eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Well, go ahead. Eat, drink, and be merry. And yeah, you will die. And then the very next conscious thing you will see, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Many of you, you go to church, you'll go to church this Sunday, you won't hear the gospel. You'll hear something, but it won't be the gospel. Now, it won't be as bad as Joe Osteen, but it won't be the gospel. You don't even know what the gospel is. The gospel always does three things. I bet you couldn't tell me. Now, and again, that's not Ricky's words, but the gospel and people will people will express it in different ways. The gospel does three things. It destroys self. It instills humility and it exalts Christ. The gospel is not your story. The gospel is, is his story. And you're, you're not the main character. Jesus is. And in fact, for the gospel, he's the only main. He's the only really character. And if, if you want to insert yourself, you're just a bit player. You're just a, you're just a cog in the wheel. And, and in fact, I, I love how Dr. John MacArthur tells it. The, the love is not even about you. The love is the father wanted to give the son a, a gift. And he said, I'll give you the church. The son loved the father so much. He said, I'll come and I'll die. And I'll experience a moment in time when I won't feel your presence. We're just, we're, we're just recipients uh, of the love between the father and the son. But go ahead. Keep eating. Keep drinking. And keep thinking you're married. 
you will die and you will spend an eternity separated from God. Now, I just want to quote the scriptures. Jesus says the road is narrow and few find it. What road are you on? What road are you on voting for Democratic candidates that literally spit in the face of God? Where's the bad news? You're okay. I'm okay. We're all okay. As if our actions in time and space, that God is just this celestial genie, that he's the proverbial uh God who looks the other way. Nope. God is so holy, he cannot look upon sin. And he will deal with unrepented, unconfessed sin. I want to show you a short clip today. Uh, Pastor uh, Paul Washer. And it, it's amazing. He's at a visiting church. And even before he takes his text, he, he, he sets the ground, he, he sets the foundation for his sermon. I won't show you the same, I won't show at least the, the entire sermon during the clip. I'm just going to show you the brief introduction and then I'm going to remind you from Eric Dyson and from Al Sharpton. I hope you can see the contrast. I hope you can see the contrast. Those two individuals don't have the gospel. I can show you John MacArthur. I can show you Paul Washer. I can show you Vody Bauckham. Uh, I, I can show you R.C. Sproles. And, but you, 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 you can't even tell. And, and that alarms me. And so what is this about? I understand. I'm a watchman. Every believer is. Because every believer is part of the priesthood of the believers and so i'm a watchman and I, i'm answering the call to duty and i want you to know many of you think you're saved but you're not and i can tell it by your actions i can tell it how you vote i can tell it how you buy into uh radical uh, radio, critical race theory I, I i can tell how you are blase about Black Lives Matter. You don't hate what God hates. You don't hate abortion. You don't hate same-sex marriage. You don't hate the gender revolution. You're on board. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Yeah, you will. And the very next conscious thing you will experience is you will stand before an almighty God. Remember, everybody will live eternally. The question is, will you live as a friend or will you live as a foe? And you showing me that you are not on the narrow road. You're on the broad road. You are the ones who will stand before Christ and expect him to say something positive and he will, he will shock he will give you the utter shock of your life. And he'll say, depart from me, you work of iniquity. I never knew you. And you'll say, oh, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not prophesy in your name? He'll say, I never knew you. I'm trying to warn you. I'm Ezekiel's watchman. Because if I don't warn you, then the Bible says the, uh, the blood is on my hands. Not doing it. Can't do it. And so, I, and again, I don't know how many people will see this, but if you're seeing it, you've been warned. Let me just warn you from the biblical perspective. Examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Ensure and making your election and calling sure. Let's talk about it. Hi, 
I'm Ricky from the Thinking Critically from an Evangelical Worldview and welcome. Today is July 21st and today is a good day for it is the day that the Lord has made. The Bible said his people will rejoice and be glad therein. And I'm one happy to be in the land of the living. The only place I would rather be today doing what I'm doing right now is to be with Jesus himself. And so I welcome you to the channel. And uh, I would ask that you would strongly consider clicking the subscribe button, telling your friends, clicking that bell to be notified of upcoming videos. And today we're going to talk about the gospel. Never going to let go of the gospel. I don't think many people in the professing church really understand what is the gospel. And I see many examples in, in mainstream media. Now, I'm not speaking about every individual church, but what's, what's, what's prevalent in social media uh, is not the gospel. And when I see people uh, attempting uh, to speak for God. And so today, I just want to show you Paul Washer. And I'm going to show you just the opening uh, uh, introduction to his sermon and how he sets the context. And remember, brothers and sisters, a text without a context is nothing more than a pretext. And so the gospel does not make any sense if there's not a fundamental understanding of the bad news. Eat, drink, and be merry, for we all shall die. And, and so uh, my friend Pam McKinney talked about how John MacArthur says, none of us, very few of us have eternity on mind. Everything is about the here and the now. What about the now and the later? And that was, a, that was a candy uh, that we used to love when I was growing up. They're called noun laters. And the whole concept was you would eat a few now and then say some for later. How many of you are storing things up for later? How many of you are storing up treasures for later? How many of you just living for today? With no real thought about tomorrow. No real thought about, hey, I'm temporal. There's something beyond it. Hey, three questions. I, I used to, when I taught, I taught, I taught my kids three questions, three fundamental questions about life. How did I get here? What's my purpose while I'm here? And here's the most important one. Where am I going when I leave here? Now, if you buy into nihilism, that we come from nothing and we're going to nothing, well, then logically, consistently, if I'm consistently thinking, if I'm coming from nothing and I'm going to nothing, well, what's in between? You know, remember that song? Nothing from nothing leaves nothing. Gotta have something. If you want to be with me, I think that was Bill Withers. Uh, that's the most you ever hear me sing, by the way. But, uh, so brothers, that's why uh, evolution is so, so, first of all, it's depressing. And if you live out evolution to its logical conclusion, it, it's what Nietzsche said. Suicide is the only logical response to evolution. But I believe that I'm here because there's a creator. My purpose is to use the gifts and callings that I think God has equipped me with. And then where am I going? Well, I believe that Jesus Christ offers me eternal life, which I accepted. And, and so... Three questions. How did I get here? What's my purpose while I'm here? And these are big questions. And then most importantly, where am I going when I leave here? I want to show you again, Dr. Paul Washer. And I just want to show you an example. Excuse me. There we go. So I tell you, every day I get the hiccups. Uh, but uh, so hopefully you can excuse that. I, w <laughs> I want to show you Paul Washer. And I just want to show you a couple of uh, short clips of, again, contrast. You know, the, the FBI, they, they do this when they want to understand counterfeits. Well, one, they want to see what a real bill looks like, but they also look at the counterfeit. But they, they spend most of their time looking at the real thing. And so I don't want to spend most of my time looking at the wrong thing. I want to be able to understand what right looks like. And, and, and hey, I'm a visual learner. If I'm learning something for the first time, I need to see somebody do it. That, yeah, that's, just don't put it in a book. I want to see somebody do it. I'm a visual learner. Some people are uh, audio learners. Some people uh, are textile learners, which means they, you know, they need to do it. I need to see you do it. 
because just uh, I need to see you do it first, and then I can say, okay, that's what right looks like. And today I want to show you what right preaching looks like. Remember, three things: watch Paul Watcher, watch him destroy self, watch him extill humility, and then the only biblical response is to uh, uh, exalt Christ. So picking up Paul Washer, he's a he's visiting at a church, uh, and just watch how he starts. Privilege for me to be here with you this evening, a tremendous privilege. Before I get started, the pastor has asked me to uh, to introduce myself. My name is Paul Washer, and um, and I need some help with the microphone. My name is Paul Washer, and um, I serve with the Heart Cry Missionary Society, which we support indigenous missionaries around the world, in South America, in Europe, Eastern Europe, Africa, Asia, the Middle East. God has helped us greatly in doing this work of preaching the gospel among the nations. I'm also married. I'm married to a citizen of Spain, uh, who lived most of her life in South America. Her name is Chado. And I have uh, two boys, uh, Ian, who is nine years old, and Evan, who is seven. And then I have a daughter who is uh, three years old and um, also the most beautiful girl in the world. Uh, she takes after her mother. Um, and again, it is a tremendous privilege for me to be here and to address you, and to address you with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, before we get started, let me say a few things. A few things that are very important. There are people in this room right now who, if they die, will be translated into heaven and they will bear upon themselves a glory unspeakable. And there are other people in this room right now who, if they die, will be sent by the judgment of God straight into hell. Where the grace of God is totally removed and they will be revealed as the monsters that they truly are. You see, those of us who preach the gospel, we are not here to entertain you. We are not here to talk to you about temporal things, about how you can get the best that you can get out of this present life. No, I am not concerned tonight about your self-esteem. I am not concerned about whether or not your billfold and your checkbook balance themselves out. I'm concerned about one thing. One day, each and every one of you will stand naked before a holy God and you will be judged. That is my great concern. This is not a game. This is not something that has to do with culture. Western or Eastern. This has to do with the word of the living God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, life and death, heaven and hell. And it is an amazing burden for a preacher to stand before a group of people knowing that some of you will hear my voice and go to heaven when you die. And others of you will hear warning after warning after warning. And you will not listen and you will die under the wrath of God and spend eternity in hell. That is why it is such a difficult thing to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now before I take my text, I want to say one other thing. I am particularly burdened. For the young people who are here, many of you who are older, you know what it's like to follow Christ. You know what it's like to pay dearly for your faith. You know what it's like to suffer. You would rather die than deny Jesus Christ. 
or live in a way that contradicts His Word. But young people, listen to me. Many of you were raised here. Many of you were born in the West. And you need to be very, very careful. This Christianity is not a cultural thing. This Christianity is, is not something that just should be a small part of your life. It is not something that you do on Sunday. Christianity is not about you living in the world six days a week and coming to church. Christianity is not about you being just like the world all the time and then coming to church on Sunday. If that is your Christianity, you have no Christianity. You are not Christian. It is a dangerous thing to be raised in a Christian family. It is a dangerous thing to be raised in a Christian community because you may think that somehow because your parents are Christian, you are Christian. Or because you come from a group of people who have suffered that you too participate in that glory. That is not true. Young people, let me ask you a question. How do you know that you're Christian? How do you know that you have truly come to know Christ? How do you know that if you died right now, you would go to heaven and be accepted by God Almighty before His throne? How do you know? You say, well, it's all of grace. Yes, it is all of grace. We are not saved by works. We are saved by grace. We are saved by believing the promises of the gospel. That is true. But what you need to understand is grace is a powerful thing. That he who has given you grace to repent and believe gives you grace to continue repenting and to continue believing. He who gives you grace to believe unto justification also will give you grace for your sanctification. That you might grow in holiness. As a matter of fact, listen to me. One of the greatest evidences that you have truly believed in Christ unto salvation is that God has begun a good work of sanctification in you. He works and works and works to make you holy. Now let me ask you, is that a reality in your life? Young choir behind me, let me ask you a question. You sing beautifully. But can you honestly tell me that your great desire is to be holy? Can you honestly tell me that your great desire is not to be like the world? To not be like what you see here in the West and many other places, but to be like Jesus Christ. Can you tell me that? Because if you cannot, you should be afraid. You should be very afraid. Those who love the world... Do not have the love of the Father. Now we're going to take a passage tonight in the Old Testament. And we're going to look at that passage. It's a new covenant. Wow. And he hasn't even really started preaching yet. But he's laying the context. I'm okay. You're okay. We're all okay. Eat, drink, and be merry. None of that. None of that stuff that Al Sharpton or Eric Dyson or many of the churches that will open their doors and and and, and play church. You know, uh, uh, that was a big expression when I was growing up. We you need to you know some of the older members would always admonish the congregation. You need to quit playing church. Are you are you seeking holiness? Is that your desire? And uh, I, or are you coming to church to have your, e your ears tickled? Is your church preaching on how to become a better you? Is your church trying to uh, give uh, sermons on how to have a better marriage or how to raise your children successfully and, and how to go after the American dream? Or is the church saying you're a wretched sinner and you better desperately run to Christ? That's Paul Washer. And he, he hasn't even really started officially preaching yet. Now, now, no guarantees for the results. Some of those people there could have been letting that go in one ear and go out the other, but that'll be on them. 
Paul Washer is preaching the gospel. Because again, the gospel is the good news, but the good news, good news about what? Good news that you are a wretched sinner and Christ is a great savior. Run to him, cling to him, call out to him in, in, in desperation of mercy. Kiss the son lest he be angry. And, and so I just wanted to just, guys, brothers and sisters, come out of the darkness and then come into the marvelous light. Jesus is not looking for, to be your buddy. Jesus is not here to fix your marriage. Jesus is not here to help you become a better you. Jesus is here to become your Lord and your Savior. And be ye holy, for I am holy, is his command. And, and so uh, I just, I just want, I'm just a guy born in Mississippi, grew up in Chicago. And I simply, I'm here to tell you, I love Jesus. And it's my desire to grow in holiness. Some days are better than others. Sometimes it's one step forward and two steps back. But I'm, I'm here to tell you, I'm 57 and I'm a little better this year than I was last year. If I, if by God's grace, if I make 58, I, I hope to be a little better as I go forward. And so uh, I just want to show you a quick story. I went to a men's retreat uh, and maybe I've shared this story before, but uh, I, I think it's uh, apropos and the pastor, you talked about you break life into four quarters and because again, life expectancy is around 80. And so roughly, uh, roughly, technically I'm not in the fourth quarter, but hey, it, it's my story so I can tell it. But so I'm 57 and you know, 60 is really the fourth quarter, but I, I'm pretty close to it. And, so I know this, I have more days behind me than I got in front of me, statistically speaking. And I just want to finish them out for the Lord. And, and wh whatever doors I see God opening. And, and so uh, I, I just exhort you to not to be in love with the world and be in the world, but not of the world. And, and that's not to say we can't enjoy things. And uh, I'm going to Chicago. Uh, for uh, hanging out with some of my fraternity brothers and we're going to the Cubs Sox game. And, and, uh, and so I, I'm not averse and, and Christians, grounded, mature Christians, we're not averse to having joy and having fun things to do, but the kingdom is always first and foremost in my mind. Often days I wake up and, and, and I say, Lord, I just wanna give this day to you. And uh, before I know it, it's 10 o'clock and I've sinned in words, thought, and deed, but boy, it's always my desire, and it's, the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. Uh, and so uh, it's, it starts and stops, ups and downs. But uh, we, we desire uh, to be more like him. And he said, he who begun a good work will finish. And so we trust him. We know this, all things are working together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose uh, and that we might be conformed to the image of his dear son. And, and so brothers and sisters, the church is a body of people who are becoming more and more like Christ. Some better than others, um, but you gotta, you, a, a, the church is an organization and an organism. And anything that's dead is not growing. And so if you are in Christ, uh, Paul says that over 60 times, in Christ, in Christ, variations, in Christ. If you are in Christ, you are growing. Remember, remember, uh, he is the, G God is God the Father, the divine dresser. He is divine and we are the branches. And so long as we're tapped in to the uh, divine, we're going to grow again some more than others and that's where gifts comes in and and that's where we get to heaven and i'm 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 expecting the, the apostle paul some said there's five gifts some said there's six gifts i see the apostle paul getting all of them i hope to i don't know and it's not it's not it's, it's not it's not that kind of contest but uh, i hope to hear jesus award me some crowns
And remember, we're going to lay all those crowns down at his feet. Because these things that we do, we, do, we don't do them in our own strength. Uh, Paul says, no longer I who live, but Christ who lives inside of me. So the good that I do is the derivative good. And what I mean by that, it doesn't come from me inherently. It comes from the Holy Spirit living on the inside of me. Uh, and so Paul Washer. So, uh, of course, I'll put the link to the entire sermon. And the great thing about Paul Washer, he's an old school preacher. That sermon is a hundred. It's an hour and five minutes. And that's what I grew up on. But now most churches, it's 30 minutes and they're out. Sometimes uh, when I was growing up, our church, you know, our church began at 11. It, it was theoretically supposed to be over by one. Sometimes it was two, sometimes 2.15, you know, and, and you got out when you got out. And so it, it's not like now where, you know, my church, you know, it's going to end about 12, no more than 12.05. And we started 10.45. So it was a relatively short service. So I grew up on old school gospel, African-American worship. And, uh, and, we, and again, another thing, we was at church all day. And you, so some of you can can, uh, can, can relate. Uh, I just want to, again, I just want to show you a brief clip. And I don't know how long uh, um, we listen. I, I, oh, well, uh, about eight minutes. About eight minutes we listened to uh, Pastor Washer. And again, he got another 57 minutes to go. I would encourage you uh, to listen to his whole sermon. Um, and uh, I think he was preaching from Ezekiel uh, and uh, about the warnings. But again, uh, the warning. So you got to have a context and then the promise. And, and so here's my question. Is, is, your pastor, is your pastor preaching you the gospel? If he is, tell me how he is. And if he's not, you need to go to another church. You, you need to prayerfully consider leaving your church and finding a church that's going to give you the solid word of God. That's the only thing that's going to sustain you through these troubled times. And brothers and sisters, it's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. And I'm just going to show you a brief clip of Al Sharpton and uh, uh, Eric Dyson. Remember, Eric Dyson is at the natural, na National, I'm sorry, National Cathedral. Al Sharpton is at George Floyd. And again, and again these are, uh, oh, and oh, you know what? I, I change of course, change of course, change of course. I'm going to show you a clip uh, from Eric Dyson, and he's going to say some of the most profound things that, I, again, he, he acknowledges he's an ordained minister. And listen to what he has to say. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you three clips. I'm going to show you Eric Dyson at the natural, National Cathedral. I'm going to show you uh, a short clip of uh, Al Sharpton at the George Floyd funeral. And then I'm going to show you a blasphemous statement from Eric Dyson. And, and Eric Dyson was in the context. He's talking to other African-Americans. And, he, you know, sometimes we let our, you know, sometimes we kind of let our guard down. And we, and we like to say we, we, we're keeping it real. And, and, and so this is uh, Eric Dyson keeping it real with his peeps. And watch what he has to say. Okay, so I just wanted to show you a short clip uh, from a speech that uh, Eric Dyson gave in 2017. He's promoting one of his recent books. He's at a uh, event and he's being now asked a question from a uh, woke uh, Caucasian uh, female. And she's asking, what can we do in light of the uh, President Trump uh, presidency? And so uh, that's where we're going to pick it up and, and then pay attention to what else. I'm sorry, Eric Dyson has to say about Jesus Christ. Own fellow sisters who are black and red and brown and yellow. And I think also then co forging connections between all of us uh, to move forward in the age of Trump. Because I'm going to tell you what Trump teaches us. Ain't nobody can afford to be bigoted from your own pet peeve of your own nasty little narrow way of looking at it. 
So, so white brothers and sisters got to give up the white privilege. Black people got to give up the nastiness in terms of we don't like poor people, uh, or we don't patriarchy, and we're homophobic. All that stuff got to go. And, and spare me with the Jesus and the Bible and all that bullshit. All right, that's and I say that as an ordained Baptist minister. It's right in the Bible. The bullshit shall be give up. Right, and that's the thing we got to do. Spare me Jesus and the BS. And I speak as an ordained minister. Really? Is this what you accept? Is this what you condone? Is this what you get behind? And again, I'm always speaking primarily to evangelicals. This is what you want to hold up as speaking for you and speaking for the kingdom and speaking for Jesus Christ. Spare me the Jesus and the B and all the BS and, and I speak as an ordained minister. And let me see if I can just quickly uh, go back, listen to it again. The point is, Dr. Peterson has shrewdly led me back to your point. Uh, the point is this, is that yes, we have, to, we have to challenge white women. We have to challenge liberal white women. We have to challenge, challenge liberal whites because it ain't just him, Donald Trump. Because if, if, if Frankenstein's name is a doctor, then some of the soil you've been living off of has produced him too. Some of your obliviousness and some of your indifference has also fed and fueled the rise of that monster. That monstrosity is not just located in his body, it's also located in the body of thoughts that we have participated in and some of the privileges and advantages we've enjoyed. So I think ultimately, I think, look, the women's movement, the women's march, march was powerful. I think women of color have their own issues that are also in concert with women's uh, issues that are largely feminists who are white, but white women have to be told, taught, and encouraged to listen more intimately to the calls and claims of their own fellow sisters who are black and red and brown and yellow. And I think also then co forging connections between all of us uh, to move forward in the age of Trump. Because I'm gonna tell you what Trump teaches us. Ain't nobody can afford to be bigoted from your own pet Here it comes. your own nasty little narrow way of looking at it. So, so white brothers and sisters got to give up the white privilege. Black people got to give up the nastiness in terms of we don't like poor people, uh, or we don't patriarchy, and we're homophobic. All that stuff got to go. And, and spare me with the Jesus and the Bible and all that bullshit. All right, that's and I say that as an ordained Baptist minister. It's right in the Bible. The bullshit shall be give up. Right, and that's. I, I don't know what outrages me more. Because, you know, it's one thing for an idiot to say something. But then when those, the masses, they laugh. What was humorous about that? That did not magnify the name of Jesus Christ. In fact, that is the opposite of the gospel. Remember, I, 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 I would submit to you the gospel does three things. that destroy self. That didn't destroy self. That didn't instill any humility. And it's certainly that statement of itself does not exalt Jesus Christ. And, and, and so I would just love to be a fly on the wall when Eric Dyson stands before his maker. Remember, the Bible says every idle word will be brought into judgment. And, and so uh, that, that for the believers, not uh, the Bible says there is therefore no condemnation to those of us which are in Christ Jesus. And so we don't stand before God. Uh, to give an account of our sins, but we do stand before God to give an account of our stewardship. But I'm going to submit to you that Eric Dyson, unless he repents, he will not stand at the Bema. He will stand at the great uh, white throne judgment, and he'll give an account for what he said here on that day. And Christians don't speak that way. And most certainly, Christians who are called and commissioned by God to speak for him. Don't even speak to in that way in jest, off the cuff, hyperbole. And I, I use all of those uh, literary devices, but you will be guaranteed you will never hear me speak in such a disrespectful way that you heard Eric Dyson. This was not something off the cuff. This was him, this was Eric Dyson keeping it real. This was the real Eric Dyson. This was that, hey, when I get around my peeps and you know, sometimes we have church lingo and then we have our, our, our ugler, other lingo, you were seeing the real Eric Dyson. Paul Washer, 
I can guarantee you he would never speak in such a fashion because it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. But I just wanted to show you, Eric Dyson does not have the gospel. Al Sharpton does not have the gospel. Jeremiah Wright does not have the gospel. Creflo Dollar does not have the gospel. T.D. Jakes does not have the gospel. Oh, and there, there are plenty of Caucasians. Joel Osteen does not have the gospel. Benny Hinn does not have the gospel. Joyce Meyer does not have the gospel. Uh, Beth Moore does not have the gospel. Marilyn Hinckley does not have the gospel. Uh, Jesse Duprentis, I think that's how you say his name, does not have the gospel. Priscilla Schreier, and I'm going to be covering her in uh, the next video that I'll be producing later in a few minutes after I can get this edited and posted. Priscilla Schreier, the daughter of Tony Evans, does not have the gospel. Do you know the gospel? The gospel is you are a sinner. You are a wretched sinner. Christ is a savior. He is the only savior. And you're trusting in his death, his burial, his resurrection. And you're clinging to him and him alone. That God might look at you and look at you, look at you through the lens of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel in a nutshell. You're a sinner. Jesus Christ is a savior. And you trust in him and him alone. That's a, that's the quick, down and dirty, that's the gospel. Got to be the bad news. And then we got to present the good news. And then by faith, you appropriate the good news of Jesus Christ. His death, his burial, his resurrection. You're never going to hear that from Eric Dyson. Uh, and again, this playback, what you heard Eric Dyson say, uh, I was, this was sent to me and I was floored, I'm still floored, how someone who claims a faith relationship with Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, the very God of God, the very light of lights, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, you would have the audacity, the temerity, the courage to say that in front of a live audience. And again, I don't know what outrages me more, Eric Dyson, you heard the audience laughter well there will soon come a day they won't be laughing every knee will bow every tongue will confess so again a short little clip of Reverend Al Sharpton at the beginning and remember all I showed you was uh, Paul Watcher's very beginning of his sermon look how Al starts his Those and I'm going to announce all of them that I'm giving. Because this is a time that we need to understand that they are going to do everything they can to delay these trials and delay the accountability and try to wear this family down. And many that are standing and coming today and skinning and grinning in front of cameras will not be here for the long run. We must commit to this family, all of these family, all five of his children, grandchildren and all, that until these people paid for what they did, that we're going to be there with them because Lives like George will not matter until somebody pays the cost for taking their lives. We cannot just act like this is some new way of teaching sociology. We can't act like this is some new need for some of us to add social justice to our programs on Sunday morning. There is an intentional neglect to make people pay for taking our lives. If four blacks had done the one white, if four black cops 
had done to one white, what was done to George, they wouldn't have to teach no new lessons. They wouldn't have to get corporations to get money. They would send them to jail. And until we know the price for black life is the same as the price for white life, we're going to keep coming back to these situations over and over again. Either the law will work or it won't work. So I want to give honor to the family and a commitment that we're going to be here for the long haul. When the last TV truck is gone, we'll still be here. I've gotten to know some of the family over the last few days. I've seen them cry in private. I've seen them talk. I told them I grew up a black family. I know we always don't get along. I got some cousins watching me now that better never call me. That's what families are. But I've also seen them in light moments. I'll never forget last week when the family part that was there talked with uh, former President Obama on the phone and said, we're not asking you to come because it would take all the Secret Service stuff and all that, but we just want Where's the gospel? You can watch the entire video again, but I, I guarantee you there was no gospel. And oh, by the way, uh, Derek Chauvin was arrested. Uh, and I believe the other three were arrested. And, and But does not the Bible say vengeance is mine, said the Lord? And we better be careful in our cries for justice. Go back and le read Luke 13 when the audience cried out to Jesus, what about the ones who were killed uh, at Pontius uh, Pilate's table? What about the 13, or, or I forget the number, but what I think it was 13. What about the 13 souls that uh, the, uh, the tower fell on them? Go look at it. Uh, Jesus says, unless you repent, you, you too shall likewise perish. And, and so here's, Joel, here's uh, Al Sharpton, ordained minister not calling anyone to remembrance and say yes it's okay to say something appropriate about the deceased but you better be using that opportunity you better be using that platform to preach the gospel because see the way George not, not, I'm sorry uh, George is going to face George Floyd faced the same reality that every lottie dotty everybody at that funeral faced and uh, yes it's appropriate to eulogize but a Baptist minister, a gospel minister, better be able to preach the gospel and draw people's attention. As again, Pam said, draw a people's attention to eternity. All he's talking about is temporal things. Justice. Uh, and maybe we will. A lot of times we won't. How's that going to help you for your eternal state? crying for justice. Be careful for the cries of justice because if we cry for justice too closely, God might give it. But if God ever gave justice, then he has to take care of you. I'm not crying for justice. That's not the gospel. We're praying for it. We're crying for mercy and, and grace. We're not crying for justice because if God ever decided to meet out justice, he would have to deal with us. I want grace. I want mercy. Because of the length of the video, I won't. But what I will do is I will link to uh, Eric Dyson uh, in the uh, video that uh, if you want to go back and refresh your memory, you can either look at that little, you can either click on the link or you can uh, just check at the uh, library, uh, my library, the Thinking Critically Inventory, and look at that video where I uh, just show you, I walk you through that Eric Dyson does not have the gospel. Paul Washer has the gospel, gospel preacher, because he gives a context. You got to have understanding of the bad news. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Yep, that's true. 
but many of you will die and the next conscious thing you will experience is you will stand before God not as a friend but as a foe if you want to take that journey with me click that subscribe button you'll see it in a few seconds uh, and then hit the bell to be notified uh, I, Lord willing, will post a new video tomorrow where we will talk about prayer. Uh, many people are erroneously teaching. And I was now uh, introduced to, I uh, hope I say her name right, she's the daughter of Tony Evans, Priscilla Shriver. Uh, I want to show you how she mangles uh, John chapter 10, verse 27. The sheep, know, the sheep know my voice and won't listen to strangers. Brothers and sisters, that has nothing to do with prayer. And I'm going to be able to show you, again, remember, a text without a context is nothing more than a pretext. Uh, Priscilla Schreier, and I'm hoping I'm saying her name right. Uh, she doesn't un understand. She's just not right to divide in the word of truth. Uh, and she is not to be listened to. Prayer is us talking to God and God speaking to us, not through signs and and, 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 and symbols. He speaks to us from the word of God. I'll be able to show you tomorrow. Hebrews chapter 1, beginning in verse, in the first uh, opening verses. Uh, Jesus, God has spoke to us in diverse ways, but in these last days, has spoken to us, spoken to us through his son. Jesus is the last revelation of God. And there is no new revelation. If God were to be speaking to you, it would be just the same thing as scripture. God cannot speak in a non-authoritative way. And my dog is maybe giving me a signal it's time for her to go outside. So I'm going to stop here. Keep your hands to the plow uh, and seek to serve for an audience of one. I just want to quickly, I just want to click it and invite you uh, to consider purchasing my book. Weighed and Found Wanting is now available in hardcover, so you can get it in hardcover, softback, you can get it on Kindle, and you can get it on Scribe, and also at other major book uh, retailers. And so I got to let my dog out and uh, have a great day. It's hump day, ran eight miles, getting ready for the Chicago Marathon, 83 days, and a wake up.